What time is it? Okay. <laughs> All right, Jake, behave, please. So, yep, people are coming in. Um, welcome, everybody. We'll start in a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, great, it's filling up. Um, so we'll start right at seven and then just sort of dive in from there. And I just, I need to thank some people and do some introductions, but. Okay. We'll give people a chance to show up. Sounds good. Oh. Yeah, great. All right, so I'm gonna mute for the next couple of minutes and we'll get started right at seven. Well, it looks like it's seven o'clock, so we'll get started. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this, our first lecture in the Fall Journalism Lecture Forum. Uh, my name is Will Yerman. I teach in the Donald P. Belisario College of Communications Journalism Department. I'm also the Norman Eberly Professor of Professional Practice. And I'm going to introduce our speaker in just a moment, just a couple of quick things. I'd like to thank Joe and Shirley Eberly for establishing the professorship and the endowment. Um, that supports so many of the activities we're able to do, things like this, bringing in speakers and training for students. Um, Joe's father, Norman Eberly, graduated from Penn State in 1924. He went on to a long career in journalism and writing, and this endowment um, started by his son and daughter-in-law is to honor his professional career and his memory. Um, the lecture series this fall will continue all semester long. It's um, not every week, but most weeks. Some weeks we have two. Um, Next week, Eric Meyerson, who's a super talented video editor, producer, and writer is gonna talk. And he's gonna talk about how um, the power of limitations and how that can actually make you more creative. And we certainly have our limits this semester, so that should be pretty interesting. 
If you're new to Zoom webinars, this isn't a meeting, it's a, it's a webinar. We can't see you, we can't hear you. So you are welcome to just sit back and kick off your shoes and, and enjoy Regina's talk. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Depending on your device, you'll see at the bottom that there's a Q&A button. Please feel free to ask questions of Regina and we'll, we'll get to them uh, maybe after her talk, um, but we'll circle back to any of the questions and I'll try and keep an eye on those. Um, so yeah, I think that's all the, the business that we have to do. I'm really excited and pleased to have Regina here to kick off the series. Um, Regina Boone is an award-winning photojournalist. Right now she works for her family's weekly newspaper, the Richmond Free Pe Press, Richmond Free Press, sorry, in Richmond, Virginia. Before that, she worked for about 14 years for the Detroit Free Press. Um, in 2016, a photo of hers from the Flint water crisis was chosen by Time Magazine for its cover. Um, and this summer, she's been covering a lot of the unrest and protests in um, Richmond. She said uh, earlier we were talking that at one point she had worked 60 straight days without a break. Um, and she said today she got up at 530 to cover the first day of school. So um, I'm really happy and, and honored that she was able to make time for us. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Regina. Uh, post your questions in the Q&A as we go. And um, if you have issues or whatever, uh, just, just let me know and I'll try and keep an eye on that. So, so Regina, I'm gonna let you take it away. Okay, thanks, Will. So, all right, here we go. Uh, thank you for that nice introduction. So it's, it's, it, has, it's, it has been only recently, I started coming from behind my camera and letting a light shine on me. At this very moment, I am remembering the cues I get from yoga and meditation just to breathe live in this very moment. It used to sound so cliche, but now it's a very real and an important tool I use. The breath is everything. If only my 18 year old self had known this, but it all makes sense now, everything comes in time. So if you don't mind, would you please take a deep collective breath, like this, or in whatever way feels right for you. This allows you to check in with yourself and your feelings right this moment. I wish I had been taught this early on as I maneuvered my adolescent and college years that were dotted with tears, anxiety, thrills, and exuberance, all typical emotions, but mine had the additional weight of confronting racism on top of everything else. How does the breath, breathing, and pausing, juggling emotions have anything to do with being a photojournalist? everything. First and foremost, my breath reminds me to recognize I am alive, I am grateful, I do have a career, and a purpose. Secondly, when I'm on an assignment, it reminds me to take an intentional breath, to slow down, to observe, and to be mindful of those around me, whether it is, whether it is other working journalists or those whose lives I am documenting. I try to pause and get a pulse of my, of my surroundings on the streets or in someone's personal space that I've been allowed to step into. I take nothing for granted. I'm not entitled to be in, in other space just because I have a degree, a job, a job with a press credential and a camera and a notepad. As I mentioned before, I am used to, yes, hiding behind my lens and pressing my shutter, observing, asking questions, and not being the center of attention at all. Today is a little bit different. I stand here away from my camera and share the different perspectives that have shaped my work and life and brought me back home to document and to focus on my community, Black Richmond, Virginia. As each of you know, life is all about perspective, isn't it? And processing thought and connecting to what we see and feel. I want to introduce myself while also introducing and weaving together a story of a young family I met along the way while on assignment for the Detroit Free Press, where I worked for nearly 14 years as a staff photographer. Meeting this family profoundly affected me. Oops. Uh-oh, hold on, oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, let me just make sure, okay. So, meeting this family profoundly affected me. This image is the time cover from 2016 that many of you may have seen of the of then three-year-old Sincere Smith connecting you to the Flint water crisis 
that still is an issue today, despite what headlines you may read. I believe there is a message in his name, a reminder to approach life and everything with sincerity. He caused me to see from his perspective. He drew me in with his eyes. We connected instantly. I listened to Sincere's mom tell my colleague, a writer, Alicia Anderson and me, about having to purchase water to cook with, to drink, to bathe with, wash dishes with, and even to give to the family puppy. The worst was not just listening, but seeing her pour bottled water into a bowl, heat it up, and then proceed to soak a tattered washcloth into the plastic bowl and do her best to gently run the cloth over her son's rash-covered body as his eyes changed from a bright, cheery boy to a tearful baby in pain. As she explained, it was like this every day since noticing that Sincere's skin was changing and his doctor telling her it was probably the water causing the rashes on his body. She said when he bathed in the home's tap water, his skin broke out and burned. She said it not only caused him pain to bathe, but it caused the rest of the family pain because they felt his. Listening, I completely felt their pain and began to identify. I cringed while also breathing as deeply as I could. I also became uncomfortable with my camera in my hand, but I also knew the power of this tool that possibly someone would see his picture. Just maybe the people responsible for the water crisis in Flint would listen and maybe act when they saw the pain I saw and felt. As his mom continued to bathe him, I saw the crocodile-like texture of his skin. I saw that he was not a baby with skin like butter. Tears welled as he bathed. Water had gone from being safe to frightening. The clicks of my camera were slow and with purpose as I took it all, as I took in all of this. I remember letting my heart do the thinking. I continued to push my shutter and his eyes connected with my soul. This may sound dramatic, but it's so true. We connected during one of those clicks. I saw him see me. This is when many photojournalists would have continued in this moment with the camera to one's eye. I chose differently. I eventually put my camera down. I told Sincere my photos would help make him feel better. When I told him how special he was and how I was so happy that, that he was allowing me to photograph him to help others, our eyes locked again. This time, not through a lens, but eye to eye. Suddenly, I now felt like we were just, suddenly I now felt like we were not just parachuting into their lives at this moment, and that he truly understood us as people who had come to share his story and were genuinely on his team. I looked at my colleague and I said, oh my God, he totally understands. He is listening. He definitely is an old soul. Never did I imagine at that moment we connected that he would later become the iconic face of this crisis that remains today. It all makes sense now. That moment was so sincere, a connection that moved me from behind my camera. Reflecting on my connection with sincere, I've come to realize there was a reason we connected. It's because of my own story and the things I've been exposed to since birth. I was born 50 years ago between deadlines. Impeccable timing. That's it. 14 days before the inauguration of the newly elected Virginia governor at the time, Linwood Holton, who by the way, is the father-in-law of the once vice presidential candidate, Senator Ten King. You would have thought I was a princess and my mom, the queen, flowers were everywhere. The story goes that there were so many because of my father's penchant for and tenacious editorial support of positive change in the former capital of the Confederacy. People wanted to thank him. They showed their gratitude by welcoming me. A feisty old school crusading editor, my father, Raymond H. Boone, was heading the Richmond Afro-American newspaper at that time. Because of his editorial leadership and vigorous endorsement, the black vote was mobilized and Linwood Holton was elected the first Republican governor since reconstruction in Virginia. The moment was big for my father. 
personally and for the state he worked hard to cover fairly. But an even bigger moment would happen just four years later. I am a survivor, a survivor who was struck by bad news at an age not much older than little Sincere Smith. I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and given less than a year to live. I started kindergarten in Richmond, totally bald, after 18 months and several rounds of chemotherapy and radiation. It was just before my dad died of pancreatic cancer in 2014, he told me what he said to the doctors about my prognosis. I almost choked the doctor and reminded the doctor he was not God and that our daughter is, going, is not going to die. She is a fighter. That moment with my dad is where I think I gave birth to connecting even more to those in pain and those fighting battles beyond them. Simply put, I identify. Amazingly, my first days of school were uneventful. My parents, however, struggled. I have no memory of being ill, nor do I remember being teased, taunted, or harassed. Kindergarten, they say, is when you learn everything you need to know for the rest of your life. Dealing with cancer made me compassionate, made me love underdogs, and helped me understand people who are considered to be different. Fast forward, we arrived in Baltimore, Maryland. Our home was in a predominantly upper-class white neighborhood. My father was now vice president and editor of the Baltimore Afro-American, a black newspaper where he was in charge of 13 newspapers along the East Coast. My education in Baltimore started at a city public school to an experimental school on the campus of Towson State University to Roland Park Country School, an all girls predominantly white prep school. Although I was socially accepted and mostly kept up academically, it was a challenge to be a black teen teenager among many sheltered privileged girls whose multicultural experiences were often just knowing the other girls of color and me sprinkled throughout our school, their family's maids, those who worked at their country clubs, and the black people who, as some put it, lived in the bad neighborhoods, quote, bad neighborhoods of Baltimore, and were the ones they told me that their parents told them to roll up their windows and to, and to avoid those people when driving downtown. This period of my life made me self-aware, and I had to become adept to, at handling subtle and obvious forms of racism. It actually prepared me for today's world. Unbeknownst to me, this school, this school culture was teaching me not only academically, but socially. It taught me how others lived, thought, and reacted. It taught me about white privilege, systemic racism, generational wealth that included a very intentional way of living in a bubble. At home, I was being educated to love myself as a black girl in a mostly white world. On our walls were my parents' heroes, from Frederick Douglass to Harriet Tubman. Roland Park girls would, would visit and ask if they were my relatives. I, would, I was always so stunned, many knew nothing about my world. My mother was now an advocate at the Children's Defense Fund in Washington, DC. Visits to her office made me realize there were many ways to fight for equality, along with the newspaper, as my dad did. I began to take note. I was comfortably existing in multiple worlds, code switching instinctively. I often look back on my life and think I was reared to be comfortable in the hood or having tea with a queen on any continent and in any community. Choosing what was next after Roland Park was difficult. My parents wanted me to go to an HBCU, a historically black college or university, and I was adamant I did not want to. I did not understand from where I was, from where I sat at Roland Park, the importance of attending a school where I could be in the majority and not have to explain my life. I did not realize how tired I was and how I was always maneuvering to stay afloat. At that time, I resented my mom and dad for saying I needed to open another door to another world to push me more to my true self. I did not quite get their talks about growing and learning in a whole different way at Spelman College in Atlanta, but they knew what was good for me. And even if my college counselor did not, she advocated that I take a gap year. My parents were livid. 
with mixed emotions of joy and sadness in 92. When I graduated from Spelman College, I headed to Osaka, Japan. And uh, I headed to Osaka, Japan to teach English to junior high school students without knowing Japanese or much, or much about the culture, even though my paternal grandfather was Japanese. When I left Japan three years later, I, I traveled through Southeast Asia, East Africa, South Africa, and Europe for 11 months with just a backpack and my camera and a few lonely planets along the way. Travel made me realize I had knowledge to share. This warranted stories, pictures, and yes, faxes, home of my tales of studying traditional Thai massage in an, in an ancient temple in Bangkok, riding an ostrich in South Africa, living with a Buddhist nun in a temple, learning to live off the Pacific in Indonesia, teaching English at an orphanage in Uganda and at a school for blind children in Kenya, helping to make traditional paper in Nepal after visiting with a shaman and sneaking into Tibet past the Chinese army. Following my odyssey around the world, I found myself back home. Only now my parents had left Baltimore, returned to Richmond to start a community newspaper called the Richmond Free Press. This is where I began to lay, to lay my foundation as a photojournalist before heading to graduate school at Ohio University School of Visual Communication. As I, as I was graduating, I was hired by the Detroit Free Press where I worked until three years ago. Soon after that, I was accepted to the prestigious Knight Wallace Fellowship at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. This unique program allows mid-career journalists like me to take a big exhale and clock out completely from the newsroom, from daily deadlines and the stress of the day-to-day -day grind. Although I'm a visual storyteller, I opted for something completely different and very personal to pursue. My project in a nutshell was to piece together facts to help solve a family mystery. This involved figuring out what actually happened to my Japanese grandfather, Surudu Miyazaki, who was arrested on December 7, 1941 in my father's hometown of Suffolk, Virginia. His sudden arrest followed the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He never returned home to Suffolk to my grandmother and their two young sons, my dad, who was just three, and my uncle, who was two years old. And he never saw his family again in Japan. He died in 1946 in Chicago from TB that he contracted at Rower, a prison camp, according to the doctor's records I found during my research. As my dad was dying, we had conversations we never fully had before. The most memorable and impactful was about his Japanese dad that he barely remembered. He revealed that he missed knowing him. He wanted to know the truth about him and, and encouraged that I should too. This was shocking since I had asked questions on and off most of my life, but barely got answers. Identity was rarely discussed in our family. We just knew we were black, end of story. Now he challenged me from his bed to find out what actually happened. Do we have other family in the US, in Japan? I was given a heavy task. Although I had lived and worked in Osaka for three years in the mid nineties, I did not learn much about this family mystery then. While on the fellowship, I had access to all of the resource, resources of the University of Michigan's campus. I also had time on my side to sit and think and to begin to understand the pain and trauma my father carried his entire life. I began to understand all of our stories even more. I began to connect the dots, realizing this is my story too. Another exhilarating part of my research during my fellowship was the opportunity I had to share my story with NHK World, equivalent to our PBS. They broadcast my story in Japan and helped find family members I had only dreamed of. With their assistance, I met two cousins, a 92-year-old matriarch of the Miyazaki family and her 84-year-old sister. As a journalist, my father spoke for so many who needed assistance by advocating with his pen during his impressive career. Although this could have been his biggest story ever, I believe he knew he could not tell it. It was just too painful. 
He spoke about this throughout his last days and had and had he not spoken up, I would not be standing, I would not be standing or sitting here speaking my truth and understanding truly what it means to go home and the importance of telling our own stories. I believe as I continue to do as my father asked, I'm not only sharing our family story, but I'm sharing many unknown facts of American history and connecting more dots. Yes, there were Japanese Americans on the East Coast in the Jim Crow South, and many were living and working in black communities as my grandfather were, was. These are facts. My father probably never imagined I'd find as much as I have unearthed. It all has one theme and that no matter how difficult, it is always important to return home as I did by traveling to Japan to my Japanese family's hometown in Minami, Shimabara, Nagasaki, and three years ago, moving back to Richmond after 17 years of being away and returning to the newspaper that my parents founded in 1992. I believe everything happens for a reason and there are no coincidences. Remember the little boy sincere I met in Flint while working at the Detroit Free Press? Remember his name? Remember the connection I had with him? As I reflect, I believe it was at that moment that I met him that it clicked that I needed to move with more sincerity in my life, follow my gut, and move home to tell more stories about people who look like me and for a company that respects me fully. Just as I began to get really antsy in Detroit, a buyout opportunity surfaced. I volunteered and returned home. I easily left behind the grind of a daily newspaper and began to heal from PTSD of that life and began to breathe easier, telling the stories of my very own community. I began to feel seen, valued, and respected. And then March 2020 arrived when COVID-19 hit us all like a bag of bricks. Despite these hard times, I could not be happier to be home covering my own community even more and close to my mom, brother, and friends of Richmond. It does not feel like a job. It feels like divine timing. Then let us recall the horrible day we all learned of George Floyd's heinous murder. Then let's think of the way People poured into the streets screaming out because of pain and trauma. And it was not just for the death of George Floyd and the other names of people murdered unjustly by police. People had hit a boiling point. I was on the streets documenting all of this of Black Richmond as they expressed their generational pain that went back as far as 1619 when Africans were captured and brought to the shores of Virginia enslaved. I documented the pain of adults of all generations and children who feel the pain from systemic racist laws and practices in our community nation to the bigoted Confederate statues that stood and one still stands along the street called Monument Avenue. I documented police and protesters up against one another. I locked in these evil statues coming down and the cheers. I knew this pain firsthand I did not have to understand or study this moment. I grew up being taught about the symbols of hate and white supremacy that surround us daily in this city and in this country. I understand the fist in the air I focus in on. I get the anger, the tears, and the silent moments. I get what it means to say I cannot breathe and what it means to value the breath. I realized as I go out day after day, I am truly home. As a black journalist from this community, I am home to lock in the truth of this moment and all of our history. My mom and dad prepared me for this moment in time. I am the perfect person for this job from where I stand. For too, for too many years, others, white journalists have interpreted our pain and trauma. And now I'm on the front lines telling the stories of my people and my home. I think there is no coincidence I was led back to hold my camera up, focus and click here on my turf. I'm recording my community. I'm not misunderstanding my people's cries and pain. I also know all of this is not new. I am not working for a news organization trying to understand Black America and catch up on this story. I am healing, transforming and cleansing right now, even as I stand before you, speaking about truth, reconciliation, and finally letting out a big exhale. 
Although I'm tired, often angry, I do feel good to share my perspective with you, which I hope maybe one of you will get will get what exactly what I'm speaking about and find your way to speak your truth with, with sincerity. I'm breathing and I hope that you are too and that you will remind yourself of this simple tool that we cannot take for granted. I am glad I am home at this important time to document my streets and I'm glad to be able to share my truth with you, with you and for our future. Thank you. So that's it. <laughs> So that was wonderful. Thank you. Normally there'd be a big round of applause, but <laughs> for you. I hear it. I hear it. <laughs> Maybe if they're not asleep. <laughs> oh, we've got a big crowd out there. So yeah. there's, one, there's one question in the queue that we'll get to in a second. And I'd encourage everyone to, if you've got questions for Regina about, you know, anything related to her career, um, drop them in there and we'll get to them, um, you know, over the next, over the next little bit. So, um, Originally, I was going to ask you about kind of how your career started, but I sort of <laughs> like to stay focused and, and maybe we'll get there. But I really like to stay focused is on this idea of that you that you spoke to at the end of being a black woman photographer documenting your community and why that's important. And that connects a little bit to the one question we have from Kurt um, about the difference between covering working in Detroit for a large mainstream newspaper, part of a big chain and what that audience is like as compared to documenting your home. And maybe you can speak to that. So yeah, um, there's definitely a difference. First of all, like I mentioned, uh, just that daily grind, right? Um, we're a weekly newspaper here in Richmond. So we have a little bit more time uh, to think about exactly what we wanna cover. Um, and we do have a specific, uh, perspective that we are, or we have a specific, specific audience that we are shooting for, writing for, and that is the Black community of Richmond. Um, whereas working for a big daily newspaper, we're shooting, writing for the entire community. Now, not, that doesn't mean that our paper is not a newspaper that is for everyone. Our paper definitely is for everyone, and we do cover other people. So I, I don't want people to think it's, you know, it's exclusive, but our main focus so the difference i think is just you know that you are, i know that i'm in my community i'm recognized in my community people know to call me um it's just it's just like putting on a good pair of shoes that fit right it's just that comfort and i'm not having to appeal to several editors or the up above to please certain boxes to check off like do we have enough uh diversity? Do we have enough this? Do we have enough that? I know what we need, right? And our newspaper has its focus. And being a Black woman uh, photojournalist, I know what I'm seeing. Um, and I know I'm going to be respected by my editors here in, in Richmond. Not that I wasn't respected. I was respected in Detroit, don't get me wrong, but there were just more people to answer to, more themes, more, it's just everything now is a little more focused. So the, the, um, the stress is less and that's really, it's real. And I just feel more authentically me and just being, I feel like I'm doing an important job that I'm locking in things for People 30 years from now, 40 years from now, they'll be able to come to my work here in Richmond and know, oh, this person, Regina Boone, we can go to her to find out what was really happening in, in Black Richmond, right? Um, I've kind of went all over the place with the answer, sorry. <laughs> that was great. It, it leads me, and there are some questions coming in we'll get to in just a sec, but um, do you think being in, at home where you're more relaxed, where you feel more like yourself, has it changed your photography? Like, can you think about how your images have changed now that you're back? Yeah. I think the first thing is I'm, I don't have an editor like breathing down my throat every day for a daily deadline. And I'm not having to, to feed the beast, so to speak, you know? I'm not having to, uh, I don't go shoot like, we don't cover crime unless it's like, Something. I mean, we don't. We're not. We're not chasing ambulances, is what I mean. I don't think. I don't think many newspapers do that anymore. But we definitely don't, and we never did. Um, 
We have a formula at our paper also that my father put into place when he started the paper. Always on the cover of our paper, there's always a positive image of a child so that we're saying that a black child especially can look at our paper and see themselves and see themselves in a positive light. It can be the most simple uh, image like this child on the side of uh, the Robert E. Lee statue, but I mean, but she's looking towards the light and there's, there's hope in that picture, right? And I mean, we, but just every time there has to be some sort of slice of life of a child. And I think I love that because so many times I used to see in daily papers throughout the United States, so many negative images, especially of black people and people that turn, why would someone want to pick it up every time when there's always negativity? Whereas at least here in Richmond, amongst our readers, they know, and we've been around since 1992. I meet people now who are parents who were, now their child is in the paper. And they're like, oh my God, I was in the paper when I was a kid. So I like, I mean, that's just very refreshing. And that's reinforcing positivity. There's so much negativity in our world that I love that little, it's not little, it's a big dose of ex being able to exhale and pick up the newspaper and not cringe. I used to actually cringe sometimes with my own, where I used to work sometimes. So I know I won't cringe um, here. <laughs> so I like that. Um, That's a big thing. I mean, to be yeah. able to feel that way about your paper. Yeah. But there's a quick question from Emily, who's from Detroit and wanted to know where you wow. lived when you were in Detroit. <laughs> okay, is she from Detroit, Detroit? I'm from, yeah, I lived on, um, I lived in the West Village uh, on the east side um, on Parker Street, <laughs> to be specific, <laughs> off of East Jefferson. So, and I watched many changes in Detroit because I arrived in Detroit in 2003. When I came to visit Detroit from, Ohio, I came from Athens, Ohio. They, they flew me out, not that far of a flight from Columbus to Detroit, but I did fly. Um, and I landed at this beautiful airport and then I was brought, it was in February in Michigan. So imagine, and I was brought, they're trying to show me the best of Detroit in 2003. And to be honest, it looked like a bomb had hit downtown. It was cold, it was, Oh my God, I was miserable, but everyone was so positive. And so I was like, is everyone wearing different glasses that I'm not wearing? But I was won over by the kindness of people, the Midwestern hospitality, which is a little bit different than Southern hospitality. So yeah, so tell her, I guess she hears me, of course. Yeah, hopefully you hear that's great. <laughs> uh, the next question is from Mohammed. He says, my name is Mohammed. Uh, he's an MFA in the School of Visual Arts. Yes. He wants to know, do you consider documentary photography filmmaking as an art form? Do you see any relation between documentary photography and photography as art? Ooh. Can I just give a yes? <laughs> yes, I do. I do see it as an art form for sure. Without a lot. Sometimes it's good not to be wordy. So yes, I do. <laughs> when you're out shooting, how much of your brain is trying to make something artistic versus telling a story versus just getting the facts? I think that's a good question. I think, especially when I worked at a daily newspaper, I did have a checklist, right? And so there were certain things that I would get, you know, get your safe images, the clean, nice, rule of thirds, all those kind of things that you learn in photojournalism school. Um, and then once I had those, you know, done, then I would kind of go for the artsy feel and try to do something different and try to, you know, work towards my own style. Um, I'm still not sure if I found my own style. I think we all just, yeah, I'm still evolving. Um, and I think now though, that I'm more relaxed, um, I think I am finding a little bit more of a style and I am shooting a little bit more, uh, I'm, I think maybe I'm more confident and maybe that comes with time with anybody, with anything you do. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do do the checklist. I think that's just kind of that, that trained thing. And then, but I quickly do jump off a little quicker than I did before to try to challenge myself and see things from different angles and 
use different uh, lenses and, you know, all those things that I still hear in my head from my professors back in the day. <laughs> and maybe part of that is feeling more comfortable in your place, in your home, that that sort of gives you the freedom to experiment more than maybe you felt at a big paper. I don't know. Just I think, yeah. And, but not saying that that was a restraint. This is my own, you know, because at the Free Press, I mean, we have so many, we had, my colleagues were amazing photographers and we all had different styles and um, there were no restraints. This is, this is just me. I think, I think it is my, my comfort level and becoming more confident and also being exposed to more work, being exposed to other photographers and seeing how they see and studying uh, picture books and newspapers and uh, IG accounts, just seeing how the world can be seen differently. So I'm still doing that today, you know, just, it's not, it's not stealing. It's, you know, you're just, I mean, we love to pour over pictures, right? I mean, I love looking at pictures and other people's work and seeing how their brain, sees that and it's so interesting when you go to let's say you go to an assignment i love seeing how my friends or colleagues who are next to me saw the same scene right and how so many things can be seen differently and i think now i think more about more about how can i see this differently regina like i ask myself that question even as i'm standing there shooting something i'll say okay now go behind or do this like it's kind of like i'm a crazy person talking to myself <laughs> but that's great that you're still thinking and trying to grow and get better and that's inspiring i hope to our students who are who are watching um so let's see so kurt has a question uh, he posted it once and then he oh. redid it i think to make it clear but oh. how many people read you in print versus um and how many people read the free press online so that kind of comparison oh. print versus online um and is it important enrichment that your paper is online or in print is that a or are you that's that a good question that's a good question so yes we we are online um we're not as great as i'd like us to be online <laughs> um coming from a daily newspaper um in terms of the presentation but we are there um but we still are very important in our community as the hard copy i should have had a hard copy to show you uh, somewhere I have it in the house. Um, but we print, I think it's uh, 35,000 is our circulation. And being a weekly, they count our paper as being a paper that it's going to be shared. So, but I can't quote you numbers right now. I don't know all those kind of numbers off the top of my head. I do know our readership has increased online. I mean, hugely since all of this has happened uh, with protests and unrest in the streets and especially with um, our perspective of the way we cover it versus the daily paper. Um, so we're getting so many new viewers, readers, followers, social media. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, so it's becoming a little fast paced again. <laughs> <laughs> especially these past few months yeah um, but sometimes we don't always put everything out there being a weekly because we do sometimes want to save some things for our our print edition as well and we you can that we can never compete against the daily right and the daily has goo gobs of money right and we don't <laughs> that's another thing you have to think about in terms of our presence you have to remember we are a Fam, majority family owned business and we are small and also we have to recognize we're we have not furloughed anyone we have never missed a, a a publication my father said when he was living if we were to ever miss a publication then we are closed you do not miss a publication <laughs> you know you do not so the fact that we are still alive during these trying times covid you know so many of my friends have been laid off have had um, furloughs. There's a local paper here. It's a tab. It's affiliated with the Virginian Pilot. They've had three furloughs this this summer. That's 21 days. That's I mean that's 15 work days. That's a lot of money. And when you have uh, 
people who have partners, you know, husband and wives that work, which often is the case in the newsroom sometimes, that's two people off. That's a lot, you know? So I, I think it says a lot that a small paper like us, we are still making it. And um, not to say, you know, we make it as a free newspaper, just like you watch TV advertisements, right? And other newspapers in the daily world, advertising is down. I will say ours has hit rocky times, but lately being a black newspaper, people are suddenly awakening and doing what they should have been doing and advertising in our paper and realizing, hey, there's a whole bunch, there's a whole demographic that we have been missing, you know? So there's some good and bad with all of this. Well, it's great that there's that silver lining for you guys, you know, the great yeah. to keep going. Um, let's see here. So we got a bunch of questions. So one of our, uh, one of our photojournalism students, Noah Riff asks, what are some of your best tips for getting connected with communities outside of your own? Uh, he says, I want to make sure I am respecting my subjects, not just coming in, taking the photos and leaving. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I mean, if he were to land in Richmond and, and say uh -huh. there were a bunch of protests, what, how should he gain? Yeah. yeah. So I'll give you an example. A Getty photographer recently landed here. I did not know their byline, but they wrote to me. They wrote to the local community newspaper and they introduced themselves and they said, hey, I've been following your work or, and they were honest. I found your work and I see what you're doing. And I was wondering if we could meet and could we connect and could you help introduce me to uh, some events that could be happening that I might not know about from quick Googles. I think that is a really good thing to not be afraid to reach out to other journalists in other spaces. I mean, there are some journalists who are territorial. We do know that. But um, I think that's a good thing to do. I think also looking at um, like community groups or places and just emailing people or looking on social media and, and just introducing yourself to people and saying, hey, I'm a photojournalist. I, I would love to meet you. I'd love to um, cover things within your community. I just think being honest and being upfront and, and not trying to play games and not trying to maneuver in a fake way. Just be authentically yourself and never show up without your camera too. Even if you don't shoot, I say always have your camera because that's who you are. That's why you are entering in that community many times because you wanna make pictures. But it doesn't mean every time you have to make a picture, but that people can become used to knowing who you are. So my answer is just honesty. That old saying, honesty is the best policy and just, just yeah, just be just be truthful, but be polite too, and 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 do research about the community that you're going into. Know what culturally is respectable, you know, respected in that community. Um, oftentimes, you find a good person who is your sort of liaison. That could be like a journalist, or that could be some key community person who then can open the door to so many different factions within that world. And then you have like a, you, you have sort of an ambassador. And that's what I used to do in Detroit. I mean, I was the queen of connecting. I knew how to like just work it and talk to people, but I also, it's like you're, you, you're a journalist 24 seven, right? So even when I was like out, I don't know, with friends, you know, I'm always looking at um, bulletin boards. I'm always taking notes. I'm always meeting people, handing out my card. It's kind of hard to turn it off, but it ends up working for you, you know? And I don't mean it in a um, manipulative way. It's a very genuine way. So, you know, just be genuine. Long answer, sorry. <laughs> oh, I thought that was great. If, if Noah has more questions, he can, he can follow up maybe. And you can always email me too. You can share my email. I think I had a, uh-oh. I think I had a, let's see. Yep, there's my um, oh, information. So I did put my personal email, that's fine. Um, anybody can email me or follow me on social media. So these are my personal ones. And then you can always follow Richmond Free Press as well. Thank um, you, that's really generous, thank you. Um, so moving down so we get through these questions. Um, Lily, another one of our PJ students asks, 
What effects have you seen in the overall Richmond community since the free press has become an outlet or voice for the city's black community? Oh, so many. I mean, this, my parents came back to Rich, came to Richmond in 92. So we've been around for a long time. So we're a part of this community and people know, I mean, we, people read us from the governor on down. I mean, and like I said, this isn't a paper just for black people, but people know if you want to get the real nitty gritty of what's going on, you pick up the Richmond free press. And so we are respected. My dad demanded, uh, respect as and he demanded that people know the truth about what's going on know the wrongs the the joys the pain um so people yeah we're we're a household name and if you don't know us then i often question people like mm, that's interesting that tells me a lot about you if you've never heard of the free press whether you're black white you know latino latinx or asian american if you're living in this community and you are fully a part of this community you need to know all the different perspectives you have to read the daily paper you have to read our paper you have to read this other paper called style weekly which is the one affiliated with uh virginian pilot um yeah so i think yeah we're we're a respected uh, publication. We are a change maker. My father's editorials, as well as the present uh, managing editor, our editorials make change happen, force things to be brought to the light. Um, our pictures cause change. Our pictures cause joy. Um, our pictures cause tears. I mean, yeah, we're just, we are a part of this community. So, Change is always, yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> have you seen a, a big difference in the coverage, maybe specifically of the protest between what you guys have done and and the daily paper, which is the dispatch, is that right? Is it the yeah, the Times Dispatch. Um, mm. Yeah, you know, I think we, they are not, they are at the big, big events, so to speak, or the big uh, protests or the, the bigger things. They're not going to, even though they have like, triple the amount of photographers than we do and writers, right? They're not going out to everything. I mean, I understand that's not, they have other stories to tell just as we do. I mean, we're not, our newspaper is not just filled with what's happening, that particular story. There's other things we're telling, but I don't see them. Um, it is a different perspective. It's definitely a different perspective. I mean, um, course pictures if we're at the same events we're, we're covering but it's just the play of it is often different or the size or the just the impact I feel is different and and the voice in terms of who's writing um, there's a yeah there's you can read two stories and get two different definitely get two different perspectives and um and they're not they're both factual it just tells you how perspective is so important everyone has one yeah. And that you're, I mean, in a way, your community is so lucky to have more than one voice. I mean, this so is true with so many cities uh, shutting, you know, shutting papers down and they're not even being a, a newspaper. We actually have three uh, actual publications that still print in this city. Three, four, no, maybe four, four. Yeah. All right, here's a big question for you from, uh, um, from Kayla. What advice would you give future journalists? Ooh. Well, first thing is to uh, be respectful <laughs> of your subjects. Um, the first thing, like I said in the beginning, to kind of just breathe and just uh, you know, just be truth tellers and just follow your gut with everything that you do. And I mean, just basic tenant, tenets of being, characteristics of being good human beings. That's all you have to be to be a good journalist. Just be a good truth teller and be fair, um, be open-minded, have a good listening ear. Uh, you're not always right. <laughs> Um, it's not always about, it's not about you. Um, 
be a good connector, connect with people. When you meet people, reach out to them, follow up, whether it's subjects or whether it's your teacher or someone like me, just collect people in a good way. And that helps you grow. That's the biggest thing that I was taught. Like, and I don't mean it in a schmoozy sort of way. I mean it in a very genuine because each person you meet, it's an opportunity. And look at each, look at each person as an opportunity. Look at each class as an opportunity to grow and to evolve. So yeah, just be open to learning. That's what I would say. Advise um, journalists of tomorrow. Just be open-minded and not, not know-it-alls. <laughs> I meet a lot of young journalists who don't listen, a lot of interns that I dealt with who didn't have basic home training a lot of time. They've come into newsrooms dressed inappropriately. Um, think about you know, how you dress, how you present yourself, um, how you speak to people. If you're speaking to someone from a different uh, culture than you. Well, how do you speak to that person? Do I call them by their first name if they're an older black woman? No. You call them Mrs. Such and such. You don't say, hi, Jean. Da, 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 da. You know, I'd often see that. And you just, you've got to learn your place. And so I would just say, constantly study. It's, I mean, being a good journalist is constantly reading, constantly looking at pictures, constantly uh, just building your tool chest. So just build your tool chest with kindness and patience and open-mindedness mind and politeness. <laughs> all good advice. That's great. Yeah. Um, all right, so moving oh, down the list. Oh, so Noah had another question. Oh, sorry, guys. Oh. <laughs> sorry. So who is that? What's his name, her name? It's Jake. He's been good this whole time. <laughs> hi guys, say hi, Jake. He was on my lap, he did such a good job. <laughs> Great, I didn't know he was there. Yeah, to keep him from barking. <laughs> <laughs> Very cute. Um, so Noah has another question. I wanted to know if you have a photo book you would recommend for maybe photographers you follow or that kind of thing. So one photographer that I would suggest to follow who's like in real time, who actually was an intern at the Detroit Free Press and he used to sit next to me. His name is Salwan Georges. He's with the Washington Post. And he's a young photojournalist who is kind, who is amazing. He sees beautifully. I would follow him definitely on uh, social media. Salwan, S-A-L-W-A-N, Georges, George with an S. He's someone, um, even though he's younger and, he, I admire his work greatly. And um, yeah, he's this is an interesting, I'll tell you this really quick story about him. He came to the Detroit Free Press uh, from undergrad. He went to Oakland University and he came as an intern and I was assi he was assigned to me um, for me to kind of look out for him and, you know, tell him how to fill out his, uh, what do you call those forms? Mileage forms and get your money back and all that kind of stuff and just whatever questions he had. So one day he came and he was sitting next to me. And he threw down a newspaper on my desk and he was like, hey, Regina, do you remember this, this photo? And I looked at this newspaper and I was like, oh yeah, I took that. And he was like, yeah, but look closely. So I looked closely. It was the day that um, Saddam Hussein was, uh, murdered or captured what was he he was you know during the war and in that hole or whatever so in michigan you know there's a large middle eastern community in dearborn so people i was assigned that day that that happened to go to dearborn to get like a jubie picture in the streets so i shot this picture it was a, a 1a photo and it ends up salon was in the photo dancing as a kid in the streets with his uncle and now he's sitting next to me as a photojournalist. And he told me that day he saw me, I was doing all these things and he was watching me and he didn't really know that that was a job, you know, that he, and so he was really intrigued by this woman that was like shooting and moving around and following everybody dancing in the streets. And then now he ends up next to me and now he's a staffer flying all over the, the world at the Washington Post. And he's a good person. That's yeah. wonderful. So yeah, I, I'd follow him. And then old school, I've always, of course, loved Gold, Gordon Parks. 
He was my inspiration from day one. I grew up with a with the picture American Gothic. Do you know that photo with the woman with the um, mop at the Lincoln Memorial? That was a picture that was in my kitchen since I was a child. My parents had so I was exposed to black photographers early on documenting black life from as far back as I remember. So definitely look at Gordon Parks's work. And like I said, so today. So I did sort of hijack Noah's question. Is there a specific book? I don't know if Gordon. Oh, book. Uh, I don't know. I can't think of the name of a book. Yeah. Um, I mean, Gordon Parks, Google him. He has a whole bunch of photo books. Um, he has, he's had amazing exhibits. There's a foundation. Um, there's a photo, there's a photo professor at University of Virginia. You can follow him. His name is, uh, and, oh, I'll have to give you his name. And he's like the expert on him. And he just did a really good talk on, he did a webinar recently. I can share that with you and you could share it with students. Um, what books you, that's, I would, I would have had to study before. I have a whole bunch of books upstairs on my bookshelf, like, but I can't think of titles right now. That just shows my age. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think of good books to throw out there. I can't. I mean, there's like what the, the decisive, what are the books from like back in the, I can't think. I have so many books. I just can't remember the names. I used to buy them all the time and now I, I can't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, we'll move on. So, um, so the next question is from John Dillon. John was uh, the first Eberly professor, my predecessor. He's um, a oh. retired professor here at Penn State. And he says, hi, Regina, do you think Black Richmond has changed over the years? If so, in what ways? And then he says, are you uh -huh. documenting Black Richmonders differently now than you would have years ago? Oh. He says he worked for the Times-Dispatch for three decades before oh. at Penn State. Thanks, John. John, oh, okay. He does add also that he knew and admired your parents and he wanted oh. to be in here. But, <laughs> but, okay. the, but the question is, do you think um, Black Rich changed and, and are you covering it differently? Uh, no, I'm just telling the truth. I'm just covering what's before me. Um, but you have to remember, I only worked here for about four years, three years before I went to OU and then went to Detroit. So really I've only been back here a little over two years. Um, majority of my career is Detroit, to be honest with you. But I mean, of course, personally, I know the conservative Richmond, there's conservative black Richmond, there's conservative white Richmond. Um, I do think in these past months, the younger generation of Black Richmond is showing a different face than uh, conservative Black Richmond. <laughs> so I am seeing a change, but it, it, you know, I mean, there's just so many different kinds of people here and different communities within the Black community. Um, I can't say that I'm covering it differently. I just think, I just, flow with whatever happens and whatever scene I'm in. Um, I don't know if I'm answering that question well. Sorry, tell him sorry. So that was good. You did say you felt like young Blacks in Richmond may be act have changed. Is that because of the protest, because of what's going on this summer? I think because of the protest, the summer. Um, I even think though, I do think that older Black Richmond, um, are now not as like older older generation are speaking their truth more and they are coming forward and sit and telling stories of things of the past that maybe they never would have spoken of they would have just buried and just suppressed so i think we are hearing more things about some of the evil things that happened here that maybe would have gone gone unnoticed had we not been present in this uh community and had things not happened as they have as they have and as they are right now um so i do think there's a little bit of a boldness coming out um yeah it's just a different you know it's a different it's an interesting little culture here <laughs> um yeah there's a lot going on here and and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I 
I got to think on that one. <laughs> well, we can circle back if you think. Okay. So. Uh, John Beal, who teaches uh, photojournalism here, asks, uh, Richmond has seen a lot of national media parachuting in to cover stories. Could you talk for a minute about how your coverage of an event in Richmond may be different than someone who's not from the area? Yeah, well, first off, we know all the players who are involved. There's so many factions right now within like the protest world. It's kind of like a little soap opera. So I know all the characters. I know who's with this group. I know who's with that group. I know who's gotten kicked out. I know which social media to follow. I know who's who's telling it all on Twitter. I know who's coming to me directly. I'm getting direct tips. Um, somebody who's parachuting in, they're not getting any of that. There was an instance of that uh, maybe in July, there were two photographers. One came from, I remember this specifically, one came from Cincinnati and the other came from Ohio and they were coming looking for like clashes, right? And they, we, I was, it was myself, my colleague, Sandra Sellers. So there are two staff photographers at the Richmond Free Press, my colleague, Sandra. And then we have a really good friend who works for Style Weekly and then other photographers at the Times Dispatch, we're all friends. I mean, we're all on different teams, but we are all the photojournalists, we are friends here and we do look out for each other. But this particular day, it was actually an old photographer from the Times Dispatch, Clement Britt. He was there, he's shooting independently for someone, myself, Sandra, and a guy, Scott Elmquist from Style. And these two, I don't wanna say outsiders, but newcomers to the scene, they showed up and they came over and they're like, so, they wanted us basically to like tell us everything, names, contacts, like things that we had worked for and things that like, we've been on the streets like I, like 50 some days, 60 days in a row learning this. And, and they just kind of wanted us to like hand it over to them. And I was just like, I, I was, I will be helpful, but I won't give you everything. I mean, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I was helpful. Um, and I, and I see, and I could see that they were a little frustrated because things weren't happening right at the, at the monument, at the circle where Robert E. Lee's statue still stands. Um, and they were just like, so what's going to happen tonight? Where are you guys going? Da, 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 da. Um, and you could feel their anxiety. Whereas we were more like a little bit more relaxed. We knew we weren't here just for a night. We weren't looking for people banging in windows and, you know, we were it just totally different vibe. And so that's what made me aware. Like I was like, ah, this is their, the classic parish. They had their parachute on big time <laughs> and they were trying to work it fast, but they were trying to like soak it up from us. The other photographers, they kind of just walked away from me. Cause I'm known as the person who like, I'm the nice, I'll talk to everybody <laughs> and like help people tell them where to go eat and where to do this. And who to find this and give them a few places to go to shoot or say, hey, come with us. Um, but yeah, others, not people don't like to give information. <laughs> so. Do you ever see any of their work? Do you know what kinds of pictures they ended up with or? I didn't, cause you know what? I didn't even, I kind of didn't care, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't. Um, but I will help, like I've helped some photographers definitely Friends of mine coming in from, from DC, my friend, another photographer who worked with me at the free at the Detroit Free Press, Chip Soma Devia. Um, he's with Getty. Um, Sawan, I've always helped him when he comes. I mean, you know, I know a lot of people, so and people will tell people that I'm here. So that's what I say, like working your connections. And we're like, we can be one big family, you know, and it's good to introduce someone in a in a polite way it's and and then that's the way you open doors i think um so yeah that's what that's that's kind of the gist of it but yeah i didn't see their work i honestly speaking i did not go looking and i didn't i probably didn't even take their names down we because we were probably on the move and went somewhere else so yeah yeah but that idea of building connections even within the photo community so that when you oh big time definitely and especially like being a black woman photographer i try to know we try to connect within that community and then the black community and then you know detroit free press family um you know people who've worked you know generations you know 
who've gone and connect with them. Um, I mean, through different photo organizations, through social media, you meet people that you never met in person, but you might reach out to them, tell them you like their work and just be polite. <laughs> because that, once again, the politeness really, really, really goes a long way. And just being pleasant because I mean, I will say, you know, the world of photojournalism when I first started was very white male oriented. And so meeting another woman was like, oh my God, amazing. So like one of my, the person who really helped me out in the beginning uh, was a woman who worked at the Virginian pilot, Vicki Cronus. She's no longer there, but she like totally helped me and just talked to me. We were on assignment. It was actually for, it was when Tiger Woods was uh, like the big, the big name and he was here locally. I was just beginning to work at the Richmond Free Press like a zillion years ago, beginning of my career. And we were waiting for him to come talk to us. And we probably had to wait like two hours. And she's really the one who told me about OU, about VizCom, Ohio University. And so she just gave me the whole breakdown and then, and she just gave me her number and she told me to call her. And then that's when I really realized like she helped me. So why can't I help someone else? I, I'm never too busy to help. I mean, we're all busy, but you know, people made time for me and I believe um, helping the next person. And it doesn't matter who you are or what you look like. I will help you if I can, you know, and that's the thing with me. I'll be honest. If I'm busy, I'll tell you I'm busy and I, or I'll connect you with someone else that can help you that might be able to better help you than me. Um, so yeah, the, the photojournalism world is small. You can burn bridges and you don't want to burn bridges because it is a small world, <laughs> right? Yeah, definitely true. We all know each other. We yeah. all know each other. And I mean, even I think you and I have some connections of yeah, people and- At the free, yeah, some other yeah. people. Um, yeah. I mean, once you start speaking to other photo journals, you realize like, oh yeah, I know that person. So yeah, yeah. No, always sure. be a good person because the word gets out. <laughs> There's a couple more questions in the queue if you got a few more minutes. Oh yeah. So Chris Ritchie, who's on our faculty, um, asks, uh, while you don't want readers to cringe every time they pick up your newspaper, are there times you might publish a photo that does make someone cringe? if it's for the right reason, such as the photo of the little boy in Flint, mm. made people cringe when they saw his suffering. Definitely, you definitely wanna make people feel um, cringing is an emotion. Um, yes, people definitely cringe seeing Sincere's uh, sad, tra uh, cute, sad, all of that you know, combined face and feeling his pain um looking into his eyes yes definitely that's what we're here for to move people i mean that's i mean ultimately that's what sells papers right the visuals <laughs> um in many ways um and that's our job to 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 inflict emotion to tell it to make a picture that tells a story that causes someone to pause right it causes someone to maybe not even read the story, but no, we want them to read the story because it, they work together as a team, you know, the, the two components, but um, cringing, like cringing bad is like, this is one example that I had when I first came to, but this was not a picture per se. This was a, this was a way a headline and a photo worked together or did not work together. And that's another thing you need to communicate within your newsroom with the other people, with the copy editors, with the designers, if it's still possible, you know, not nowadays, I don't know, because some things are outsourced everywhere. But anyway, I had a story that ran when I first went to Detroit, it was about the health department and free dental care. And it was free dental care in the city of Detroit. And I went there to make a picture, I had to use my uh, skills to convince someone to allow me to take a picture of their child who had like uh, lots of cavities, okay? And, you know, I had to convince this mother that this picture was gonna be used in a tasteful way and that, you know, I'm here, the story is gonna make an impact and this will allow other kids to see this and other parents to have free dental care to go to this place. So this picture ran 
I remember it was a really nice picture of this moment with the dentist and kid. The headline though, this is what made me cringe. Black kids have bad teeth. That was the headline in the Detroit Free Press, like 2003 or four. Yes, I cringed, and my, but my picture was attached to that, as was my byline, and I'm a black woman photographer who was talking to a black family, coming from a black newspaper background from Richmond, Virginia. I was like, oh my God, I cringed and I went berserk. So if you believe that it caused the wrong kind of cringing, speak up and go talk to your editors, go talk to the people who made these decisions. Did um, you have that conversation with your editors? I did. And it was early on, <laughs> like I was new there. Um, my, the person who hired me, Nancy Andrews, you may know Nancy. Um, I went to Nancy and then from there we went to the next person above Nancy and we had a whole discussion about that and how did that slip through? Or not even, like how, how can you not see, I mean, come on. So yeah, um, it's not just the pictures. It's, so it's a whole package really. Right. Um, I mean, that's part of what you brought to the paper, hopefully, was yeah. So well, in that case, just sort of common sense, it seems like. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, but we know even today, a lot of things happen that we, we all think are common sense that slip through, whether it's online or even in print, right? And people are like, oh my God, but what's oh my God? That means you need to have all different kinds of people involved in making the package from all different backgrounds, right? So that it so that if I had been reading it, if I had been privy to see that at that point of the process, if I'd seen black kids have bad teeth, what? <laughs> I would never, how do you miss that? So, but that's not about the visual, but like I said, it's the, you have to think of the whole product though, right? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, um, great, uh, two more questions and then we'll wrap up. Okay. Uh, someone asks, if journalists have to be polite and respectful, <laughs> um, why do photojournalists take pictures of famous people when they don't want it? When they, I assume the person doesn't want to be photographed. I guess maybe yeah. it's a question of how do you balance between being polite and maybe taking pictures? Yeah. I mean, yeah, there are situations like standing in front, like in Detroit, I often found myself standing in front of the federal courthouse, taking pictures of, you know, people who definitely didn't want their photos taken. Um, but I was still is that hard for you or is that just, you see it as your job? Sometimes it was hard. Even here in Richmond, I took pics, you know, I've taken pictures of people that I know, but yeah, it is my job, but people know that this is my job and you did what you did or you didn't do what you do. And I'm just doing, but I do it in a polite way still. I mean, I'm still polite. <laughs> I'm like, sorry, under these circumstances, click, 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 click. <laughs> I mean, you still can be a good person and still, yeah, I, I still, I, I don't think there's, yeah, I still think you can still be a good person and still be polite. And, and but I mean, I don't go chasing, I'm not a, I'm, I don't go chasing, uh, movie stars, I mean, that question, you know, so I'm not, I'm not in that, I'm not in that realm. <laughs> yeah, um, paparazzi, yeah. Yeah, I'm not paparazzi, we're photojournalists, so. <laughs> yeah. I remember when uh, Princess Diana was killed, I was working uh, and people just kept yelling out paparazzi every time they saw me with a camera, and, no, no, I'm different. <laughs> but, exactly, yeah, so, but even in those moments, right, you, this is when you teach people, if you have time, you can take a little bit of time to explain to them the difference and they will then get that knowledge and pass it on. And I think it's our responsibility, you know, um, to represent photojournalism. I do. Yes. Mm -hmm. And to correct people, uh, not in a brash, obnoxious way, um, just politely say, hey, let me tell you the difference. I'm not that, but I'm this, and this is why. Um, so yeah. All right. So one more question, and it's a it's a good one to end on. Kind of a big yeah. question it's from Lily again. How do you think your vision as a person of color and as a woman shapes your photography? Do you think these facets of your identity um, 
help you see what others may not. I mean, I think you've said that a couple of times, but can you talk yeah, to me yeah. about how, what that, what you bring to the table as a woman and as a person of color? Yeah, I bring, <laughs> I mean, I bring my perspective that's uniquely mine. Um, I, I check off many boxes. I'm a black woman. I'm a black woman who's part Japanese now that you learned. Um, I'm, I'm a black woman who comes from a newspaper perspective, family. I'm a black woman who, who has lived in different worlds. Um, so I do understand like racist white worlds that I've lived in. So sometimes I'm able to bridge that gap because I can speak that language, not speak that language, but I mean, I understand some things sometimes that because of exposure and because of my, uh, it, it's just because of who I am, I can, how do I answer this? Um, yeah, I just bring a unique lens. I bring, you, you and I are different, right? And so you're gonna see what you see and I'm gonna see what I see. And because of my experiences in this world that I've been in, I've been around the world a lot. So I have so many different ways of seeing. So I find myself valuable to be at the table, right? Because not only do I think of as a black woman, as a woman, as a person of color, all these different names that kind of go over my head, I think as a human being too, that because my constant theme is kindness, really, and politeness. And um, I think even when I'm fighting, when I'm fighting for, or back in Detroit, like in the newsroom, or if I'm fighting um, just to share my per share what what I think is right, it's like I just bring. I, I mean, I bring something different, um, and it's it's just the basics. Important to have all different people at the table, um, because just like that example I just gave you, had I been at the table, or had there been a black copy editor. Um, for black kids have bad teeth, I don't think that would have gotten through, <laughs> right? So little things like that, or the, the oopsies, right? You've gotta have various perspectives at the table, no matter what. Having just one perspective does not serve anyone at all. Um, and I think at this point, we all have to realize that we all are different, but, and we all bring value. And one person is not above another person, right? And one person's perspective is not better than another person's. We just have to, that's why we have to build teams in whatever we do that, that reflect this world that we live in. We're not living in a homogeneous world, you know? Um, who, I mean, who wants to? I mean, well, there are people who. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I bring a unique lens. I bring value, as do my other brothers and sisters, as do you. I mean, all of us do, but it's just about being fair and, and, and um, access and opportunity. All these key words are real words that people need to have in their vocabulary tool list and also in their checklist when hiring, you know? Um, don't say to me, oh, Regina, I can't find black photographers to hire. Where are you looking? Who are you talking to? I mean, this is the kind of constant things I've heard throughout my career. So, but that's when that whole thing about connecting, right? And knowing the people out in the world. So that's another theme of mine is making connections. And so then you aren't just with a team of white photographers. Um, there's no excuse, so. No, I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, again, sorry, my answers. Are kind of, my brain is a little bit, <laughs> sorry, all over. Been up for a while now, even just. Yeah, today. since 530 this morning. So excuse my rambling and I hope I made some sense today and I hope I didn't waste anyone's time. No, no, I thought it was great. I really enjoyed hearing your story and then hearing kind of your perspective on, on being a photographer. I mean, all your different perspectives, you know, yeah. being a family owned paper, being in Richmond, yeah. in that story, being a, a woman, a person. Yeah. Before. Coming from a daily paper back to yeah. small town. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of hats I've worn and um, 
And I'm grateful that I've had, that's the other thing. I'm really grateful for all the experiences that I have had and I hope to continue to have, even, you know, participating in this, this is great. Um, oops, sorry, take this coffee. Um. <laughs> so do you think, um, I mean, do you see yourself staying at your family's paper? Is that, I mean, are you, does that feel like the place you wanna be? Yeah, I don't see at this point, I mean, yeah, there's no need to move around anymore. Um, if I were, it would be out of journalism and maybe just to sail off into the sunset somewhere. But um, yeah, I think this is my last hurrah in terms of us, you know, being on staff and it feels right. I mean, some days are frustrating. I wish we had more money, of course. I wish we could, I could hire, we could hire, I don't do the hiring, but I wish we could hire more people and build a bigger team. I wish, I mean, there's so many things I wish we could do that money could help with. Um, but, you know, you just take each day as it comes. And um, like I said, we're lucky we haven't had to furlough as some of my other colleagues in the city have had to do at the, at the daily paper too. And like I said, at the other uh, weekly paper. Um, so I think I'm okay for right now. Um, yeah. Well, great. Well, Just thank you. I really breathing and grateful to be home. Yeah, yeah. It's nice to be working in your own home, your own town. Yeah. Yeah, Over sometimes. <laughs> yeah, most of the time, yes. <laughs> yes. I am grateful. So, yeah. So, thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the students for listening and bearing with me. <laughs> You're getting some thank yous in the in the questions, but yeah, everyone appreciated. I am sure, and I, I really appreciate you being our first speaker. So thank you. Yeah. Um, a reminder to everyone else that there'll be talks all semester long, um, and this will be the format. Um, and yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah, and again, if anybody wants to reach out to me, there's my email and uh, social media uh, handles. Great, great. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for for sticking around and listening. And uh, yeah, so have a good night, Regina. Get some sleep. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>